So today I have a real treat for you guys, an absolute legend and icon and someone I personally look up to massively, and that's Mr. Ben Mikulski. Ben is one of the world's leading experts when it comes to everything, muscle building, fat loss, and also mental health and having a clear mind, basically crushing life. So this podcast is absolutely dope. Have a pen and paper ready because you need to take some notes. Also, this episode of the podcast is brought to us via Shredden 8, which is the world's number one eight-week transformation program. The program is currently 77% off, so it's only £37 a month or $45. US The link to sign up for the program is in the show notes. We'd love to have you on board and get you in the best shape of your life in just eight weeks. Now, get ready for an absolutely insane episode of the podcast. Welcome to the Powercast with Charlie Johnson. I'm one of the world's leading fitness and transformation coaches. I'm going to be providing you with the tools to build your ultimate body and mind. Absolute pleasure today to have a man who needs absolutely no introduction, someone who I personally look up to massively, and that's Mr. Ben Bukowski, uh, all the way from USA, originally from Canada. Uh, so Ben is, I would say, probably the master of when it comes to exercise execution in the world. He teaches the best trainers and athletes in the world how to build muscle and burn body fat, and now he's got an incredibly amazing, I would say, more all-round approach probably than you originally had uh, for your bodybuilding days, Ben. So thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Really, really appreciate your time. Thanks, Charlie. I appreciate it. I don't know what the best in the world, man, but certainly aspiring to be the best and help as many people as I can. And there's definitely people out there that are much smarter than me. And, and as you say, um, I did focus for a really long time on just that one thing because that's all I knew, right? That's all I was taught. I was taught like, hey, if you just work hard, it's all going to work out. And I realized that's just not the truth, right? I realized that there's so much more than that to, uh, to actually building a great body that you love and you're happy with and, and you're confident about. And so many people face these challenges of lacking confidence, even when they have a great physique and, or they, they lack um, discipline or maybe they're dependent on substances or they're always stressed out or anxious. And you know, all that stuff doesn't need to be there. You can absolutely learn to use your exercise in an intelligent way to build not only a great body, but also character and discipline and happiness. And that's really where the business kind of cuts its teeth. I'm uh, One of the things that I find most fascinating about you, Ben, is you have an incredibly calming aura around you. Like, is that something you ha- have always had or is it something that's developed and you've become more aware of? Um, I think if I, if I were to be honest about that, genetically, I'm probably a very calm person, but I had a very stressful we'll call it childhood so i end up being very stressed very anxious very fearful and ultimately very reactive you know i went through my teenage years being very angry abrasive um aggressive and uh, i don't think that's who i was i think that's who i became based on having terrible nutrition as a child having terrible sleep habits having really no guidance <laughs> Uh, and a whole lot of stress and anxiety around me, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of substance abuse, a lot of, a lot of uh, aggression and rage and anger around myself and my family. So, um, you know, that's kind of who I became. But I think looking at my genetics and looking at who I kind of am at my, at my core, I tend to be a relatively happy, relatively calm, uh, level-headed person. It just wasn't always that way. Do you think your, the way you felt when you were younger is how, what pushed you into bodybuilding and training was a way to almost release that aggression and maybe energy? Yeah, I think it was fear, to be honest. So I was a very, very fearful kid. So, you know, I, I had a very, uh, um, very aggressive dad. He was very, um, he had a very explosive temper. So I remember being, you know, very, very young and I never got, I never cried about it. I would just stand there and shake uncontrollably. Like I was so afraid that I, and I would ter- internalize it because I didn't want to say anything for fear that he would turn that aggression on me. Never did, um, you know, to be honest, but uh, there was always that fear of like you coming in the house and all the tables are turned upside down and everything's broken and you're like, oh my God, like, uh, you know, I could be dying. So I just stand there and shake. So I remember being in university, my first year of university, I was 19 years old and talking to a professor and standing there shaking. And, I'm, and at that point I was like, why, why is this here? Like, and I would stutter because I was so afraid. And I was like, why is this here? And I started to question that, like, well, that, that, that doesn't happen when I talk to my friends. That doesn't happen when I talk to I don't know, my peers or, or other people who I'm comfortable with. Why does it happen when I'm talking to my, my um, you know, potentially authorities? And then I tied it back to that relationship with my dad from, you know, a time when it was pre-consciousness. I didn't know before I was five years old, all the stuff that was happening in my life. Uh, it was just built into my, my physiology. It was built into my nervous system. So 
um, you know, all the way till I was 19, I had this, this inbred, ingrained fear that uh, ultimately I think is why I went into bodybuilding because I wanted to build this big armor and nobody could make me afraid anymore. When in reality, I didn't need the armor. I just needed to address where the fear was coming from. But you know, the armor was certainly my greatest blessing or one of my greatest blessings in life was going through all of those struggles, all of those pains, uh, and then uh, you know, unraveling the layers of the onion, so to speak, is like, you know, we see the superficial layer and you get through it and it's just a struggle and you realize there's just another layer there that's probably tougher and deeper and harder. But, um, you know, that's why we become the people we are. Do you think that... Um experience in your childhood has affected the way you maybe reflect on your own parenting like i know you're obviously an amazing dad and you talk about your kids a lot and i feel that's the most like you're smiling yeah. now it's the most important yeah <laughs> just um, thinking about them puts a smile on my face yeah so um, i think everything in life either teaches you what you want to do or what you don't want to do and, and my parenting was uh, my, what i experienced as parenting i was very blessed to have two sets of role models in my life. So I had my parents, which taught me how I don't want to parent mostly. Uh, and then I had my grandparents who taught me a little bit more about how to care for someone um, and how to, to be there for them and make them feel safe. And I don't know that I felt a huge amount of love for my grandparents. It was mostly um, caretaking, but it certainly taught me that it was possible for, for a human, for an adult to care for a child and how to do it. And so for me, the greatest lesson in life that I got was, you know, how not to parent and how, what I don't ever want to be. And I don't ever want to be absent. I don't ever want to be angry. I don't ever want to be, um, make them feel inferior or that their emotions don't matter or that they have to be afraid of really anything. So um, absolutely, man, those, those experiences shape me. And uh, I just, and I see my children as being just the greatest thing in life. And you have this amazing opportunity to, to raise strong, happy, empowering, empowered uh, little humans, man. And I think it's just such a cool, cool opportunity. 100%, 100%. Would you say that your, the impact on your childhood affected the way you went into your bodybuilding career with in terms of training? From maybe the aggression yeah. side of things initially and sure. would you change that if you went back now maybe your approach oh, initially back then never man so um you know the man that i became was was absolutely a result of every one of the experiences in my life in my life and you know my dad gave me so many gifts um by being an aggressive man nothing in my life seemed stressful after that right so no hard workout, no diet, no amount of work, no amount of lack of sleep, nothing seemed hard because it was just like, well, this is fucking nothing compared to what I experienced. Um, and without that, I wouldn't have, I would be the person that I am. So it allows me just to, to revert back and be grateful. And I think my greatest gift in life was this uh, lack of acceptance from my parents. So like, no matter what I did, it was never good enough. That, that served me obviously in bodybuilding and business. Um, because I wanted to keep proving to them that I could. Even when I got on, on the cover of magazines and I was a professional bodybuilder, they still were, um, I don't know about dismissive, but it wasn't wasn't that big of a, an accomplishment to them as it was to me. Um, but yeah, that definitely drove, uh, you know, all of the the standards to which I held myself, right? Like I never think, still to this day, I don't think I've ever done a hard workout in my life. Yet I would do, you know, two to one of everyone else I was training, training with because, um, you know, I just was like, I'm going to, crush this i'm going to go so much further but i still don't think i've ever done a hard workout you know everybody goes oh man i worked so hard today no you fucking didn't like compared to what right compared to a navy what a navy seal goes through like you go home to your cushy bed you have all the food you want you get all the water you want i mean you got great clothes you're comfortable you can have a shower when you're done you're not fucking working hard you're soft right and that was the mentality that that i went to in in life was um I've literally never worked hard a day in my life. And my life's been just this amazing blessing. Uh, do I do things that are challenging? Yes. But I always think there's, there's, you know, probably 20 times more in the tank that I've never experienced. And um, that's why I don't ever think that when someone goes, Oh man, I worked really hard today, or, you know, I, I worked really hard to get that goal, or this is really hard for me. I always just kind of shrug my shoulders and say, okay, well, how do we get better? Like life isn't hard. You're just not strong enough yet. Right. And I say that to my kids all the time is hey, there's nothing in life that's hard. You just have to practice or you haven't practiced enough yet because that's, that's my legitimate belief. Do you also think there's an element that it's not hard work for you because you, you love the process and you love the way it makes you feel. You're not doing it for the wrong reasons, perhaps. Of course, I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it, right? I wouldn't have, like and I always say this, is that there's no amount of anger, no amount of, of anyone yelling at me or, or, or inspiring me or motivation that could have made me do what I did to become a professional bodybuilder. And you know, I hope every parent out there hears this. Like you pushing your child into something is futile. Like the amount of work that goes, that, that requires to be a professional athlete or to be a professional bodybuilder or be a, anything has to come from inside. 
right? Or, or they're going to be very unfulfilled, very unhappy, and probably resent and blame you. So um, you just have to sit back and let them find it and, and push them to work hard in everything they do, but not push them in any particular direction. And that was my blessing in life is because I accomplished what I did in, in professional sports and, and I coach a lot of professional athletes, you realize, man, the amount of time and work and energy and effort and, and sleepless nights that goes into any amount of success, there's nobody in the world that can that can hold a gun to your head long enough to make you do it for the rest of your life. It, it's yeah, it's futile. So just, you know, getting behind your children, teaching them principles, teaching them, um, you know, your, 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 your children are your clients because ultimately many parents, many clients grow up and never go through, the, never have the opportunity for, to have anyone teach them principles, right? So rather than like, hey, man, you got to do better at this, just teach them life principles, man. Like work hard at everything you do, right? Commit to discipline, commit to reflection, commit to introspection. All these things are just basic principles that we should all be committing to on a day-to-day -day basis to allow us to be our best. So I think one of the other things that you, you do so well and advocate well is like committing to learning and not just within say learning more about training or nutrition but more about yourself and self-awareness and the way you feel and the way like the why behind that because that can then have huge value to improving other aspects such as training and nutrition yeah for sure um you know education is something that i don't i don't have to force myself to do anymore it's it's ironic man because all the way through university uh, i still didn't really enjoy school like i didn't really like learning because someone else was taught i have this rebellious attitude man <laughs> i don't know if it's genetic or if it's something i got from my childhood but if you tell me i have to do something the likelihood of me doing it is very very slim uh, if, if i just kind of like go on my own i'm the most motivated guy in the world it's like this this insatiable desire to learn and get better and improve. But if someone says, Hey man, you should do this or like, you have to do this. I just can't do it. Like, I, I don't know why I can't get my head motivated to do it. My mom and I fought all the time when I was a kid and do the dishes. And I would, I would just walk away and I would ignore her and she get angry with me. And then as soon as she'd leave the room, like if she just wouldn't say anything, I would do the dishes. Cause like, Oh shit, these are dishes here. Like, so why doesn't somebody do these damn things? I want these things out of here. But if somebody asked me my, uh, you know, shithead attitude was always just to walk away. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, my commitment to education is something that comes from within. Do you think that attitude maybe you had when you were younger was why you've maybe gone off on like different path maybe than other people and sort of set, the, set your own way in terms of like learning and trying maybe different techniques and looking for maybe different variables outside of the box compared to a lot, a lot of other people? Sure. And I say this all the time. I think as a culture, as a world right now, we're very, very soft. We're very, very weak. We're, and I don't say I'm any different, but... Uh, when I was very young, I was exposed to some things as far as um, like kind of sink or swim, man. Like at seven years old, you're like, hey, dude, you either need to to find your way around this huge city or not, right? And so I learned to overcome stress and adversity very, very young. I had some stressful situations and it allowed me to realize that I didn't need anybody. And my mentality literally all the way until I was almost 30 was uh, two, to two middle fingers to the world. I'm going to do this myself. If you want to come along for the ride, jump on my back. Just don't slow me down. And uh, I, I just didn't want anybody's help. And it was like, if you're going to help me, awesome. If you're going to get in my way, I'm going to fucking stomp on you. And that was just always my mentality. And I don't think it's right or wrong. I don't, I don't encourage that with anybody. But that was the only way I knew how. Um, and, and uh, you know, go looking back on it, I don't think it was necessary. But at the same time, I think more people would benefit from having that type of resolve and that type of commitment and passion for anything. And it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be mean to people or, or, or um, disrespectful to people. And I don't know that I, I was often, um, but I was just so focused on what I had to do um, that if someone got in my way, I didn't know, I didn't have any other skills. I didn't know any other way to, to uh, push them aside or say, Hey, please step aside. I'm working on this. I'm moving toward this. You're slowing me down. Uh, the only way I knew how was get the fuck out of my way. And, and that's not always the, the most kind approach. But the thing was, as soon as that, that was done, like as soon as I got my task accomplished, I would be the first person to go back and go, I apologize. Um, you know, I love you. I appreciate you. Um, thank you for being part of my life. Thank you for contributing to my life. Um, I just in that moment didn't have the the bandwidth or the focus, I guess, or the attention to be able to to do anything other than I did. The big change point for you was that when you, your kids came along, the change your view of that completely. I'll tell you what, Charlie. I think I would still be competing if it wasn't for my children, and and that's not like a negative thing in any way. I think it's the the greatest gift. There's nothing in the entire world that it could have pulled my attention away from this sport except for those angels, man. They're, they're literally my angels. And, um, you know, it's funny how they came into my life um, at the perfect time, in the perfect way. 
um, and I, I couldn't ask for anything else, man. They literally, um, and I'm getting, getting goosebumps, but they literally, um, there's nothing in the world, nothing, nothing, nothing that could have shifted my focus away from bodybuilding. Nothing else other than children. And even after my first one, I was like, oh, I could still do this. And then God decided to throw another one at me 18 months later. And like, hey, man. And then after I had my daughter, I just couldn't be the same person anymore. Like when I had my son, I was like, okay, awesome. We're going to do guy things together. He's going to be strong. He's going to be tough. He's going to be a badass. And I had my daughter and I was like, oh, she just opened my heart. I didn't know what love was, Charlie. And I didn't know that. I didn't know what, what love felt like. I didn't know what love was. I didn't know what it felt to feel love until I, until I held my daughter. And it just completely opened my heart, man. And, you know, ever since that, that moment, and my son as well, I clearly knew a new love for my son, but I was kind of, I was resistant to it. I was like, oh, he's going to be tough. He's going to be strong. It's a hard world. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, with my daughter, I'm like, well, she can't be tough, man. She's got to have pretty dresses and girly stuff. And um, so I was like, oh, I, I need to be there for her. I need to be able to braid her hair. I need to be able to, to comb her hair. I need to be able to love her. And I can't be the, these, these two separate avatars. At least I, I, I can't, maybe it's possible, but I can't be this warm, loving, uh, caring, um, amazing dad at home and be this ruthless beast in, in, in the gym or in business. It just, I have a really hard time balancing those two avatars because they're so polar opposites, such polar opposites. I'm saying with your children coming along to that very much like set aside for you, the, mission to become obviously more successful from a business side of things obviously you have the mi40 gym which is incredible yeah. like from a training facility is insane did that really motivate you much more from that side to provide well, for that? yeah it was a necessity man like at that, that point i was doing okay in bodybuilding i mean i was probably making six figures but um I, I had one experience in my life previous to that where someone was paying me about six figures and we had a set we'd signed a 24 month contract so i was like sweet i'm living all cushy uh, four months into the contract, they get a phone call that says, hey, Ben, unfortunately, we're going to have to end your contract, terminate your contract. I was like, what? So I went from making eight grand a month to zero um, overnight. And, I was, and that happened to me very early in my career. And I'm very thankful for that because it really um, taught me uh, that later you can't risk that when you have a family, when you have people that are depending on you. So, you know, I went from, um, you know, being dependent or, or having only myself as a dependent so I was a single kind of dependency to immediately having four people to depend on because I, I got married and my wife had a stepson, had a son, so I became a stepson. So I went from single to having being a dad of two literally overnight. Um, so I literally sat down as soon as I, I heard that she was pregnant with my son and I wrote a 220 page ebook in three weeks. Um, and I just 12 hours a day, way too much coffee, not proud of it, but I got it done. And that's what became MI40, man. And I didn't even know that it was going to become a business. I just knew that I had great information and great insight. And um, you know, looking back on it, there's a lot of things I didn't know. But at the time, it was still very unique. It was still very um, valuable to a lot of people. It was very different than what everyone else was doing. And it was very uh, effective. So, and I had, I had some great mentorship, right? I won't take all the credit for that. Vince Del Monte, I'll give Vince full credit for recognizing it in me. And he said, man, dude, you're, you're better than this, better than anyone I've ever met at doing this. You need to teach people this. This is your gift. I said, oh, well, thank you, man. I had no idea. And, and I did it and I was happy to do it. And he guided me uh, every step of the way, um, you know, took me under his wing and said, hey, man, like, this, we're going to do this together. He taught me everything about uh, the online business world. So uh, I'm eternally grateful to Vince. I'm so Vince is a great guy. What's uh, it's a question for you? I've always wondered, what's, what's the 40 stand for in MI40? Uh, 40 days. So everything was, everything was uh, based around the number 40. So it's 40 day workouts. 40 minute workouts so we kept them short and we was 40 second sets so 40 seconds of time under tension so we would often do timed sets so like you actually set a timer and make sure this goes about 40 seconds and then you're going to rest 40 seconds and do it again and there's there's a lot of um, science behind all those numbers and all those phases but it also was novel i knew it was going to be a very different type of stimulus for most people when it, when it comes down to more of a sort of a training focus thing to take conversation that way a little bit what do you think are the big key things people need to focus on when it comes to maximal muscle growth that people maybe are overlooking? Because I think in the UK in particular, we have very much of an approach for like progressive overload at all costs. And I think form tends to go out the window, like sure. just move it for hoping for the best. Well, Jordan Peters perpetuated that and he acknowledges it. And I think he was, he was, uh, I mean, so bright and so brilliant. He's a good friend of mine. And um, so people look at Jordan and go, oh, it's all about progressive overload. But what they neglect to see is the 15 years of work that Jordan put yes, in you. before yeah, where, where you put in mastering the skill. 
Um, so I'll tell you the biggest paradigm shift that needs to happen in exercise if people are going to build muscle. It's actually, it's, a, it's an ironic mirror to what's, what, what exists in our society, right? So we're all focused on what? Everything outside of our body. We want cars, we want houses, we want material goods, we want money, and we think that's going to make us happy or it's going to make us fulfilled. And it's all fucking nonsense. Like I've had, I've had money. I've had no money. I've had lots of money. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make you more happy. I've been to the top of, of the, the Mr. Olympia stage and it doesn't make you happy. It doesn't change who you are on the inside. And uh, so same is true in bodybuilding. Like you could focus on all the, the weight you could focus on, on getting strong. You focus on the exercises on the sets and reps, whatever you want, all those external variables. And it's not going to accomplish the goal that you're after. What will accomplish the goal you're after is paying attention to what's happening on the inside of your body. It'd be, turning exercise into a um, almost a, a opportunity to become more present with the inside of your body. So explain what that means. If I'm focused on the exercise and focus on what's on happening outside of my body and focus on moving weight and focus on completing reps, whereas I'm, if I'm focused on the inside of my body, I'm focusing on challenged, challenging muscles. And that's a completely different paradigm. So focus on how hard can I make it for this muscle? I don't give a shit how much weight is in the bar yet. Right. I, what I fo- what I want to focus on is if I if I have any muscle in front of me, I want to challenge this muscle as max as much as I possibly can, over the greatest range of motion possible, right? Or the, or over every inch of the range of motion that you have the opportunity that you have, rather than completing repetitions as a focus. We're going to focus on maximum challenge to a muscle. Here's the thing, it's hard. If anyone listening to this podcast has ever said mm-hmm. meditating for me is hard. You should be the very one who, sit, who should need to sit down to do it. You don't have the discipline, the ability to get uncomfortable to, to do it. Sit your ass down and do it. And it's the same thing in working out. Like if, if I tell you, hey, man, we're going to do this one set, but we're going to do it really, really well. Most people will stop because they're not able to get uncomfortable. They don't have the discipline to see it through. And there's a very interesting parallel there between meditation or anything that's uncomfortable and exercise. Exercise is not supposed to be fun. It, you can make it fun, but it's supposed to be challenging, right? So you, it's all about your perspective. I enjoy the discomfort. I enjoy the personal growth. I enjoy the challenge. Yeah, I enjoy the, the, the process and the progress. But uh, at first, like if you expose someone to the amount of discomfort I go through on a day-to-day basis, they're going to freak out and they're going to panic. You don't have to go from zero to 100. You just have to go from zero to one and realize you're going to be safe. It's kind of like the first time you go into a sauna or a cold plunge or in meditation, you have to expose yourself in a graded way. Just like, Hey, today I did more than yesterday. That's a win. A year from now, if I progress in these micro doses every day, I'm going to be a way better human being. And this is where we come back to principles, right? These are principles, man. Like I don't want you to go from zero to hundred and it's very much a progressive overload type mentality, isn't it? But it's progressively overloading your discipline, right? It's progressively overloading your, your, your discomfort. We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's the same in everything in life. And I recently made a post about that, Charlie. I'm not sure if you're in my community, but uh, I recently made a post about why most people fail at a, at a diet. Read that. Yeah. So okay. it's just a, sim- it's a simple idea that you're just not good enough yet at getting uncomfortable. And a diet is going to be uncomfortable. But most people go, oh, they have, they have some meaning in their brain with what this discomfort means. So, oh, man, I'm really hungry. I have to eat. Or, oh, man, I have a little bit of stress. I have to, whatever, smoke, drink, you name their, their device. You don't have to do anything. You just got to sit your ass down and be comfortable in this discomfort. Sit with it for a while. Realize you're going to be safe. You know, it's the same idea of like if, if you put, jump in a sauna. If you jump in the first cut and it's 200 degrees in the first minute, you're like, holy shit, this is so hot. But you sit there for a minute, you're like, oh, it's not so bad. You breathe your way through it. You create these, these strategies to adapt. 100%. It's one of those things for me. Like I think people mentally, once they start to see progress things, they will understand the positives of dis- discomfort and pushing yourself like outside of where you want to be. And for me, like I know if I'm struggling with a diet or anything like that, or I'm particularly hungry and I, I just think to myself like tomorrow I'm going to look sick. So just keep like holding, wow, man. keep going, just think about yeah. what getting the goal is you want and then just hold your bottle for that. I always say all my clients who struggle with fat loss, I said, you need to change your association with hunger, right? Most people feel hunger. They feel panic. I have to finish. I have to end this hunger. Now you have to feel hunger and go, yeah, I want more of this. This is where the fat loss is happening. If you're hungry, chances are your ghrelin is elevated. Chances are your growth hormone is elevated. Chances are your blood sugar is low. Chances are your body is oxidizing fat. That's fucking awesome, right? That's where we want to be. 100%. 100%. One thing um, which I picked up from you, which has made a big, big difference to me like, when I travel a lot, is using fasting when traveling. That's something that I found from like a 
digestive point of view has been an absolute game changer for me because I tend to get a lot of digestive issues when I travel, but it's almost like works as resetting my digestion. Is that something you would implement with people like uh, periodically, like throughout the year anyway, or is that something you'd recommend? Well, someone who's looking to gain maximum muscle, it, it can be certainly um, subjective. Like I, I wouldn't say yes or no in that case. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Um, for someone who's looking for health, longevity, and body composition, fasting at least once a week for 24 hours is, is, is a very good idea. And 24 hours sounds like a long time, but it's such an easy thing to do. You, know, you eat dinner one night at 5 p.m. You just don't eat again until the next day at 5 p.m. It's really not that challenging. Um, but doing that on a regular basis will absolutely improve your digestion, decrease inflammation, improve your insulin sensitivity, improve your brain function. Um, so many amazing benefits that I would suggest everyone does at least once a week. And then the suggestion is to do a significantly longer fast, like longer than three days, at least once a month. Um, that's something I've done on and off. Like I haven't done it maybe in the last six, maybe since this year. I think I did it once. I think I did it in January. Um, but uh you know, it should be on a monthly basis, but honestly, when I'm sit, sitting at home working on Corona or sorry, working through Corona, working on my it business, on corona. yeah, exactly. Working through my business. Um, it's, um, it just hasn't been on my mind yet. It's probably a good time to start doing it. I actually think I'm going to do a four day this week. I don't know if you know it's the same thing, but I think fine for my side of things, like my mental focus and clarity is so much higher when I haven't eaten anything. Which Way is why I always try and get my high value tasks and then complicate done first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. so I can be like laser focused or anything because as soon as I seem to start taking a lot of food, my, I just seem to lose concentration. I'm not quite as on it as I was before. So now that says something to you, right? That says something to perhaps the type of foods that you're eating or the volume of food you're eating or the way your body is absorbing and, and assimilating those foods. And maybe just, so this, this is the irony of, of the nutrition industry, right? We have all these nutrition zealots go, oh, show me the data. They're like, well, dude, show me, tell me what you feel like, right? Like, I don't give a shit about the data. I give a shit about N equals one, right? You. And like, if you feel like shit when you eat a steak, well, don't eat a steak. Like I haven't eaten chicken. I've eaten chicken probably three times in the last three years uh, just because I, it doesn't work for me. Like I just don't feel great on chicken. I feel bloated. I feel my, I get brain fog. I could eat, you know, beef or elk or venison or all these wild, wilder type meats all day. I feel amazing. If I eat chicken, I feel like crap. If I eat fish, I feel amazing. So you have to learn if learn to listen and pay attention rather than just having this paradigm around, Oh, this is healthy and this is not, it doesn't make sense. So some vegetables may be great for you. Some uh, others may not be. hundred percent. Are there any like red flag foods that you found you try to avoid with anyone other than the obvious or anything that people may well be overlooking? Do you think? Well, chicken is one. I think that most people think chicken is this ubiquitously, um, that chicken and rice diet life. Oh, it's terrible, man. Chicken is one of the most poorly fed animals on the planet. And you become not just what that animal, but you become what the animal ate. So when they're eating soy and corn and other shitty grains, like that's ultimately turning into your body. Um, so I think chicken is one of these, these, um, these foods that are just massively overrated. Um, you know, if you're going to choose it, make sure they're eating a natural diet, make sure they're eating, maybe you can eat turkey. Turkey tends to sometimes be better because they, they tend to not mass produce them as much they're not just feeding them soy and shit to fatten them up uh fish wild fish i like all those things i mean that that kind of stuff is important obviously gluten i really think gluten is just one of those things that every human being should, should remove um especially in north america there's just no there's just no benefit and could you argue like oh i can get away with it i don't give a shit what you can get away with you can probably get away with eating a donut every day too but it's probably not the best idea for your long-term health um so yeah i would say gluten's one most grains are, are pretty much a complete waste of time. The only one I think is maybe useful is, as I would say, white, white rice, just because it's a carbohydrate source. That's really not inflammatory to most people. Right. So we're just looking for, you know, I kind of, I kind of um, frame nutrition through this lens of inflammation. So is it increasing inflammation? Then don't eat it. If it's not going to increase inflammation, then you're, then you're good to go. So as you say, Charlie, you get a little tired when you eat something in there is likely driving inflammation, but it could be your microbiome it could be some leaky gut that exists it could be just stress that as soon as you put that food in it sets off some uh, alarm in your body that's telling your immune system to, to respond with this the stress immune response or this inflammatory response um, which could be just a cross-contamination of proteins like maybe you have a mild allergy to gluten and maybe you took a little bit of dairy in with that and gluten and dairy and casein tend to go hand in hand or like you know, there's so many different uh, reasons why that could happen but ultimately, if you get to health, meaning you heal your gut, you heal your microbiome, you reduce inflammation, you optimize insulin sensitivity, you have a much uh, wider window to experience foods without having those negative effects. Interesting you mentioned dairy because that's one of the things that absolutely like 
ruins my body that it can't tolerate at all, which I think a lot of people are very much the same, but they're completely, un completely unaware of. Like, as you were saying earlier, some people are so uh, disassociated with how they feel and like connecting the dots of like their digestion, they're having issues and what they're actually eating, what's causing these. And these, like from my side of things, have such a big influence on people's end results because if their gut's a complete mess, they're not going to be absorbing any of the food they're eating anyway. Yeah, and the gut wall, it's important to know it's one cell thick. So any small amount of, of um, negative stimulus is going to cause problems. So you have to be super aware of like the quality of everything going in and not just quality, but the volume of poor stuff, right? So I'm not against having occasional junk meals or you know, whatever, but if it's, it's the, if it's the majority of your diet, there's going to be a big problem. So I just think of it like buckets, right? You put a bunch of toxins in your body, it starts spilling over. It's going to start having an issue. Your body has a certain amount that it can process every day through your liver and other detox pathways. So if you, if you are exceeding your bucket, you're going to experience problems, inflammation, ir irritability, poor insulin sensitivity, fat, fat gain. Um, if you're not exceeding your bucket, you're probably going to be fine. Here's the catch. Everyone has a different bucket. Some people have, can get away with much more. And we all know those people who can eat shit and still feel okay for a certain amount of time. And we all know those people who can barely look at any junk food and they, and they tend to get inflamed or fat or, and again, those buckets are um, one genetic, two really based on your history um, and, and exposure. So it could be something in the environment you don't even know is there. Like in the UK, you guys have huge amounts of, of pollutants and, and pesticides and stuff. You know, Australia has huge amounts of pollutants and pesticides. So you got to be careful with that stuff. With more than the US? Uh, certain types. So I think the UK has more uh, industrial types of toxins and environmental um, inoculants ultimately. So uh, the US definitely has more glyphosate, which is terrible. A atrazine, which is terrible. Um, so as far as those things, the US has more. I know the UK has kind of um, outlawed them 10 years ago. So your food supply might be better. Uh, but I'm sure there's something in there that they're using. But we know that as far as like the industrial chemicals are going to be higher in the UK and, and, and Australia. Absolutely. And um, we come back to sort of how the body functions. One of the things I've heard you talk about uh, a lot is like the analogy of the body's got, body's got like different knobs that you can turn up and down. And most people just tend to crank up like training intensity and volume. And then there's other ones you can look at like sleep and uh, breathing. What, what do you think are the key aspects there that people are perhaps overlooking? Well, if you break it down, Charlie, um, if anyone's got a pen, I suggest you write these things down. There's really only six things you can influence in your body, right? So you can influence how you move, how you eat or how you nourish your body, how you sleep, how you think, how you breathe, and that's five, and the environment in which you do them all, that's six. That's all you can influence. There's nothing else you can do. So you have to look at, well, which of those six am I really not paying attention to? So I'll, I'll, I'll say them again for people who weren't paying attention. Um, eat, move, think, sleep, breathe. That's it. There's nothing else you can do. So under each of those and the environment in which you do all those, under those, there's a lot of different ways to chunk down. But that's the big picture way to look at it, right? There's only six things I can do. Okay, well, which one am I not doing really, really well? And each of them is of, is of equal importance. So much, some people try to place more weight on, on training. You're wrong. Some people try to place more weight on nutrition. You're wrong right? Because they're all this, this complete system. If you're not breathing well, you're going to be a mess. If you're not sleeping well, you're going to be a mess. If your environment, your light exposure is wrong, you're going to be a mess. If you're not moving, eating, thinking, mindset, they're all going to have the equal ability, depending who you are, maybe not equal, but they all have the equal potential to impact you in a positive or negative way. So if they're one of those six you're not paying attention to, or two of those six or three of those six, you better start focusing on them. And that, that's what I call my six pillars of a lean, healthy, and muscular body. You got to pay attention to all of them. Well, it seems well, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So if, you're, if you have all the others dialed up and then you've got one that's through the floor, then that's going to be the anchor holding you back. Always. So your body will always break down at its breaking point, right? It's, it's the bottleneck. And so I had a client ask me today, like, hey, Ben, I've got, this, you know, I coach, I mentor coaches. And he said, Ben, I've got this client and she's been doing really well, but she's stagnated. I'm not really sure what to do. And the response is always, you have to look at the bottleneck, right? So what's that one thing that if I could objectify it, I would know that it's her limitation. So it's, you know, is she breathing well? Is she eating well? Is she moving well? Is she thinking well? Is she sleeping well? And how, what's her environmental exposures? And I would look at each of those, just walking through them in order and go, okay, well, which one is, is the worst? And for most people, it's all of them, right? And we have to move all of those up progressively and not just myopically focus on one. You know, if you're a nutritionist, oh, nutrition's everything, man. You just got to be in a deficit. 
bullshit. If you're, if you're a trainer, oh, training is the most important. You know, you got to focus on, on how hard to train. Well, bullshit. They're all, they're all wrong because ultimately the human body is a system. So if I put something in, the way, the way I frame all of these things, they're just signals. They're sending a signal into this system in the hope that you're going to get this external, this response, right? So we have external signals that create an internal response. So I'm sending all, all these potential signals and I'm doing them in different volumes. I'm using, do, using them in different amplitudes and hoping to create this internal result or this internal response that then manifests as an improvement in body composition or improvement of muscle building. But I have to have the sum of all those things adding up to this internal system response that results then in me building muscle or losing fat or whatever the hell my goal is. So well out of interest, what's the most common variable, say the higher level athletes or bodybuilders who who come to you or have come to you in the past tend to not be paying attention to? Well, stress and sleep, right? Everyone sucks at stress and sleep. So that that manifests as gut health, that manifests as brain fog, that manifests as inflammation, as anxiety and depression. Uh, all those things tie together and it's just because it's stress and sleep. So you have to back your way into, okay, well, how do I improve stress and sleep? So stress is one of these things that turns into anxiety, fear, depression, and all those, those cognitive disorders. So you have to start creating interventions and, and movement can be a great intervention or you can create some other stress uh, modulating intervention. And it's just this balance between the autonomic nervous system, right? So we have the autonomic has two branches. You have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic and um, if we are sympathetic, it means we're stressed. And if we're parasympathetic or the parasympathetic branches are more rest and digest, and they should be in um, relative balance leaning toward the parasympathetic. We should spend 80% of our time in a parasympathetic state or doing things that are parasympathetic. And, and again, this is completely subjective numbers. This is my numbers. 20% at maximum of our time sympathetic, whereas most people are the inverse of that, right? Most people are 80% sympathetic and 20% parasympathetic, and some people less. So when you get an athlete that comes to me and I see they're, they're hugely sympathetic 22 hours of the day, or maybe call it 16 hours of the day when they're not sleeping, that's a big problem. That's a big problem. So my first intervention with these people is not changing their diet. It's often not even changing their training. It's giving them strategies, giving them principles and interventions to improve their response to stress, improve their reactivity to stress, and ultimately create a more anti-fragile body in the beginning of the day. And it all starts with as soon as you wake up, right? We have to, we have to kind of, if I wake up in the morning, and let's imagine a teeter-totter, right, Charlie? I got a teeter-totter. I wake up in the morning, and I'm relatively balanced because I had a half, half decent night's sleep, maybe. Um, uh, but as soon as I start the day, if I start to tip the teeter-totter or the seesaw a little bit in my favor, a little bit more parasympathetic, now when I get these stressful events in the day, they don't kind of tip me over, right? So most people start the day and maybe their sympathetic is, is all the way up and their parasympathetic is not really working. Um, so we have to start the day trying to balance out that seesaw or even tip it in favor of the parasympathetic so that when we then get, when we experience life events that are stressful, it's not going to tip us in the opposite direction and send us over the overboard, right? We're just like, oh, I, I see you. I, I see the stress coming on and I, can, I have the skills and the, the foresight to be able to deal with it because, I mean, I could get into the physiology of the autonomic nervous system all day, but not really the point of the conversation. But I think just letting people know that you can, you can absolutely change your responsiveness, reactiveness to stressful events and the way you perceive them by empowering yourself with a great morning routine. Do you find uh, yoga has been the biggest change for you in, that, in, in shifting your state from the start of the day and giving you more control? Meditation has been, been certainly the biggest. And um, you know, I do many different types of meditation now, but 10 minutes of meditation completely changes your day once you're good at it, right? Once you've, kinda, once you've got a, a skill set where you can kind of, I just literally picture the volume knob, right? I'm turning you all the way down volume. I'm bringing everything to the center of my body, right? Like I want my brain being centered rather than being scattered like a squirrel. I'm trying to center and turn down my, my nervous system. I'm trying to turn down my muscle tone. I'm trying to feel my capillaries dilating rather than constricting, right? Um, but yeah, so I think meditation has been the biggest one. Yoga has been great because it's this amazing way to connect with your body on the inside. So as we spoke about, most bodybuilders are so disconnected from their body because we're literally punishing our body on a day-to-day -day basis. We're trying to not feel, right? We're trying to medicate. We're trying to train. To, you know, we're addicted to training. So we don't want to feel anything. We just want to build. Well, the greatest opportunity within yoga is certainly not improving your flexibility. It's certainly just learning to connect your body, your mind, and your breath. All of those together in synergy is the most powerful force that we have as a human being. What does the Ben Bukowski morning routine look like for setting up the day? Yeah, just meditation right now. So it's meditation, uh, usually first thing, about 20 minutes, sometimes longer if I can. 
Um, I'll get into a bit. I always move first thing. So it'll be, it'll be meditation and then I'll get into movement and that might be yoga. That might be a walk. Uh, and then I'll come back and drink a, a huge amount of water, like a liter to a liter and a half of water and then get into either journaling or education at that point. And so it's not complex, man. Like I used to have these big complex morning routines, uh, but I realized that's like yourself. That's the most valuable time of the day before anyone's awake, before you've looked at your phone. So I want to kind of get into the nitty gritty as quickly as I can in my business, the stuff I've planned out the night before. Um, so that's usually what it looks like. So I'll have my morning routine maybe last uh, 60 minutes, whereas you know, in the past it's been up to two hours. Sometimes you know if I go for a walk or a workout, that's fine, and I'll come back and get into my work afterwards. But I like to get my, my most important stuff done first. And what time do you generally tend to start, start your day for you? What time do you try and get sleep? Five. five. Uh, for a long time, I was a 4.30 guy, like every day. But um, I, I just kind of let myself wake up when I want to wake up. So it's usually between five. Lately, it's been 5.24 every day, like on the dot. Um, but usually around 5, 5.15 uh, is my time. I've also been staying up later because I'm building a new aspect of my business. So that's keeping me up later. Normally, my bedtime is around like 10, 9.30, 10. And then I'm up by 5. Interesting. And for, for you as obviously like a busy father, do you factor that in as like, I know you, I know you obviously you know of him with Craig Ballantyne's perfect day formula, you know, perfect, perfect week formula, like a big advocate of get up early, crushing my stuff first thing in the morning. That's something I've massively taken on board and it's helped give me almost more control in my life. Is that the way you try and approach that? So then you can have some yeah. time of the day to spend with your kids? Well, because then you're not stressed, right? You just check all those boxes at the beginning of the day. My goal is to check all the boxes by noon. And that way, whatever happens afternoon, because you know it's going to be the whirlwind, man. You know it's going to be everything that you can't control afternoon. So I usually don't take meetings before 12. Uh, I don't do anything before 12 except for play with my kids if they're here um, or, or train maybe. But I don't take meetings usually before 1 in the afternoon. Um, and uh, everything's just focused on accomplishing the, the most important tasks. 100%. 100%. So to wrap things up, Ben, obviously respect of your time. What's the big plans for you in the next 10 years? Where's Ben Pekowski in 10 years' time? Man, I'm just talking about that. Um, yeah, geez, I, I've had over the last maybe two years, I've had a lot of um, life revelations, right? So at some point in my life, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm 100% committed to building a $100 million plus business. Um, I know I can do it because I have this ability to focus. Um, but I don't know that it's what I want anymore. So I'm kind of re-examining those goals. And like what I'd like to have is, is the greatest amount of impact I can in the world. And the reason I was attached to this $100 million business is because um, I think I have a very unique opportunity. I think I, I, being someone who's not only done it, but also understands the theory of it, there's not anyone else in the world yet who, who has done it at high levels on both ends, right? So I have this ability to both gain someone's respect and and you know, present my credibility as an athlete and also present my credibility as, as an educator. So my target is really to change the fitness industry. And uh, I want to do that by educating coaches, inspiring coaches, and also helping people transform their life so that they can live their highest and best. And, um, you know, what does that look like financially? I don't even know that it's my target anymore. It's the type of thing where I know that if I'm providing the greatest amount of value, uh, I'm going to do it. And, and I'm going to be very, very happy and secure and, and comfortable. And, so it's just looking to scale a business uh, to a level that's helping the greatest number of people in the best way possible. Um, so being a great dad, um, having multiple homes around the world so that we can travel. So because my kids are homeschooled, we have this amazing opportunity where we can go for months at a time and um, spend time in different cultures. So that's a big, that's going to be a big part of my life. Where, where would you be looking to live? man everywhere so i want to i want to go to new zealand i want to go to south america i want to go to australia uh, we're going to spend time in western canada this year um wherever they want i mean so that. yeah so um that's the beauty of what we do right charlie is is um if i have my computer and i have you know the phone i feel so blessed to have access to those things i can live this dream life um, and expose my kids to new cultures and new things. It's, it's pretty awesome, man. I feel pretty, feel pretty blessed. 100%, 100%. One last question for you, Ben, because obviously I know a lot of people are struggling at the moment with the situation with the COVID-19 outbreak and obviously financial issues around the world that some people are suffering from. Do you have any advice for anyone who's maybe struggling from like a, a mental side of things with maybe having confidence to try and achieve the things they need to do or to get themselves out of a difficult situation? <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I was going through some stuff too, man. I think my business had a huge crush, probably bigger than most people's. Um, because I mean, most of my business is dependent on people going to gyms. And when they stopped going to gyms, I got crushed. Um, and I think the best quote that comes to mind is when you're going through hell, keep going, right? Don't stop. Don't slow down. Don't take time to think. Um, you know, like 
move, keep taking daily action. And that, that requires diligence, that requires planning, and that requires taking those additional steps to focus your mind. It's very easy to get distracted and uh, be, be pulled in all these different directions. So my suggestion is wake up in the morning, create your mind. And this is the same for every day. And this is the irony of it, right? Wake up in the morning and create your mind. And that means sitting in meditation long enough to be still and be focused inside your body and calm down your muscles and create this, um, you know, if you could have, have a visual, it's this calm ocean, right? It's, it's most people live in, in, ocean, in a, with a brain that's like an ocean that's stormy and rough. And I'm literally just trying to envision the most peaceful, calm ocean that is my body. Uh, Structurally, that way, your focus will be tremendously greater. Your adaptability to stress will be greater. And uh, when you feel most overwhelmed, realize tomorrow's the new day. I can keep moving forward. I'm going to keep taking daily action. And I'll tell you what, it only takes one single breakthrough, one single breakthrough to completely change your life. Just like meeting a new, meeting a spouse, or uh, it just takes one like idea, one breakthrough to completely blow it open for you, right? So even though it's going to be hard, even though there may be days of feast and maybe may days of famine, um, it's okay, man. We all go through it. We all have seasons of life. That's why there's seasons of life. And we're going to have t- times that are hard. And there's also a reminder there for people who are going through the feast right now, right? Some people are gaining, making money and going through a feast. Help someone who's going through a famine because one day you're going to famine too. And we all do. You know, we all have bad days. So uh, that's really part of my mission is whether or not I'm on a high day or a low day, I always want to make sure that there's, there's very much someone who's beneath me right now as far as their means, as far as their level of, of uh, challenge. Um, I'm, I'm here, right? I always say like, man, I'm, I may not be able to help you answer your questions, but at very least I'm going to listen. I'm going to hold you up when you're having a hard time. And I very much provide that for my very, very small group of loyal friends and uh, my family. So that's uh, some awesome advice to finish things up with. And Seasons of Life is a uh, is, is cool expression I've never heard before. So I'll be uh, keeping and using that one. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, um, how's the best place for anyone to get in touch with you, find out more of you? Obviously, like the muscle caps are obviously on pause for the moment. I'm hoping you'd come to one in October in the UK. I think it's been rearranged for. But yeah. Is there a um, um, get in touch? Yeah, if people listen to your podcast, they like podcasts, so they can check out mine at Muscle Intelligence, which yeah. is very much focused on all the things we talk about. So it's it's um, this intelligent approach to he- approach to healthy muscle building, right? It's not just how can I put on as much muscle as possible and be a meathead. It's like how can I do this in a way that's not going to screw me up in five years or hurt my joints or make me unhealthy or ultimately kill me. We've had a lot of bodybuilders dying lately, and not the, no reason why. I have no idea, but. Uh, you know, if we can support each other in a community of, of like-minded people who are inspired uh, to take action, the Muscle Intelligence community, both uh, in, both on uh, iTunes, um, YouTube, uh, even Facebook is a great place to find me. I'll pop the links for those in the show notes below and I'd highly recommend checking them out. So I'm an avid listener myself, so still plenty of knowledge from there. So Thanks, it's, buddy. It's highly Appreciate you, man. stuff. So thank you so much for your time today, Ben. Really, really appreciate it. And um, wish you the best of luck for the next few weeks. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Cool, just cut the recording. Now that was an absolutely killer episode of the Powercast. Hope you guys absolutely loved it. Now I want to fill you into something I put together which is absolutely incredible to help you not just survive during this quarantine, but actually thrive and come out of the situation in your best shape ever. So I appreciate a lot of people are really struggling at the moment in terms of knowing how to train from home, knowing how to stick to their diet when stuck in the house. There's ladies in lockdown, guys stuck in the house. There's a lot of issues going on here. And I wanted to come forward to help you guys and girls come out of the situation as a success. Now, what I have done is completely revamped my world famous Shred Nate and Sculpt Nate programs. And what's even more exciting about this is I've given you 77% off on the price of the program. So normally it costs £149 or $200. US Now you can sign up for just £37 per month or $45 US dollars. And what's better, you can actually lock this price in for the rest of the year to see a new training program and new diet every eight weeks. Now, the new versions of the program are fully home workout based, just using your body weight and some basic bands. These will get you the normal world famous results that you get on Shrednate and Sculptinate, so you come out of this situation in the best shape ever. If you'd like to get involved, please click the link below in the podcast notes or drop me a message with any questions. We'd love to have you, not just another client of Shrednate and Sculptinate, but another success story.